Good morning, everybody. It's great to have so many of you with us again today. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, for those of you who haven't been to one of these before, my name is Matt Hadlington. I'm the Senior Business Engagement Manager at HS2. Um, and today I'll be hosting this session and facilitating the Q&A that we'll hold a little bit later on. Uh, so far in the series, uh, we've looked at multiple topics, uh, including how HS2 supply chain works um, and how best to get your business involved. <laughs> We've already talked a little bit about kind of how we'll build the railway and how it's it's not HS2 limited necessarily who's going to do a lot of the work. Uh, we're delivering um, most of it through our big tier one contractors. Those are big joint ventures who sit at the top of the supply chain uh, and deliver a lot of the work for us. And it's them that we pass our requirements on to. Um, and one of those requirements is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so we'll focus on uh, EDI. Um, which is something that we want to try and leave a step change on in, in terms of construction and the wider industry. Um, so today we'll be joined by one of our HS2 experts, uh, Pam, who will take you through some of the key things you should be thinking about, explain a little bit about our approach and talk at a high level um, about what you need to consider if you want to be part of this project. Um, just to let you know, Pam is kindly stepping in for our scheduled speaker today, um, who's unfortunately able, unable to attend. So I'd just like to pat thank her personally and also uh, ask you all to be kind to her with your questions. Um, just before I hand over, I wanted to run through a few general points. Uh, we know you'll all be busy, so we'll keep this webinar to 45 minutes. Um, there'll be quite a bit of information in here. Um, so we'll share a recording after the session and we'll also share a copy of the presentation and any of the key links and information uh, that will be helpful to you. Uh, just a quick note, if you do have any IT troubles, uh, you can leave and rejoin the event and it will start you where you um, where you finished so you won't actually miss anything. Um, so that usually fixes the problem we find. Um, we'd also encourage you to ask any questions. There's a Q&A panel on the right hand side of the screen. You can ask questions at any point um, and I'll be monitoring those and I'll be asking them um, of our expert towards the end of the session. Um, you can also like the questions that are there, uh, which will push them up the rankings and, and mean that um, we'll get to that question and the most popular questions as we can. Uh, and one final thing from me is um, we'll also be circulating a feedback form. So it'd be really useful if you could um, if you could fill that out and send it back to us, it just gives us an idea of uh, what um, what you're finding useful, what you're what you'd like more of, and also a little bit around the format to see if we can improve that. Um, so thanks very much, and without any further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Pamela, who will start today's session. Hi, good morning, everybody. I just want to start off by saying that also to EDI, just for anybody knows um, or doesn't know that it stands for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. So good morning and thank you for attending this live session. I'm going to speak today about High Speed 2's approach to diversifying the supply chain from procurement to the tendering process to contract award. We developed an approach that is industry leading, which ensures we diversify our supply chain. This happens by engaging with our suppliers or our tier one contractors as we call them, but also with our internal stakeholders. For example, our corporate procurement teams, our contract management teams, project control teams, and all the managers across the business. As a result, there is an internal stakeholder system that ensures that before they go out to tender for a contract, the stakeholder system is used to flag where EDI requirements, um, where it is required within the contract. So then this ensures that it goes out to everybody. This makes High Speed 2's approach the first within infrastructure, rail, construction, and um, engineering structures. So organizations really do look to us as an example to lead this approach on diver diversifying the supply chain. So we are always um, engaging with Network Rail and TFL, really about best practice sharing. So what we've done at an executive level to ensure that we are committed to EDI through the organization and through the supply chain. So this next picture of the slide is of our CEO, Mark Thurston, and at High Speed 2, we have an overall strategic commitment of equality, diverse, and inclusion. So this starts off with our executive leadership and at executive level. So a message from our CEO, Mark Thurston, and he quotes, we need to attract new people to the industry to ensure we have access to the widest pool, sorry, the widest possible talent pool. And to do that, we need to draw from these skills from all parts of society. 
So there will be a skill shortage across the United Kingdom in construction unless we use innovative and new ways ensuring that we attract and tap into diverse backgrounds. So we're able to design, build and deliver high speed to on time and on budget. So just some examples to expand on this ways in which we use to diversify our employees. We use blind auditioning. So this is a new term. Not many people are familiar with it. So when a person applies their CV, everything, every identifiable attributes is taken off so their name, their education, their age. Um, we will at the height have over 2000 apprenticeships over the span of the project. So currently we have 44% BAME. So that's our black, Asian, min minority, ethnic and more than 50% are female. We also have a big graduate intake as well. So even within our or own organi organization, we have um, talent and succession mapping. So this is really to ensure we identify talent within our own organization and give them the promotion opportunities. So this is really to have the support from our executive and senior leadership teams to improve the ethnic and gender diversity at this level. So just on to the next slide, whilst we have direct take of um, diverse, sorry, just whilst we have direct intake of diverse applications and applicants to High Speed 2 Limited, there are indirect employee opportunities through our supply chain and through our tier one contracts. So we'll go over what these mean at the end as well. So as a client, High Speed 2 will support our supply chain to take a more inclusive approach to attract and recruit diverse candidates. So one way we will do this is to award thousands of contracts to small businesses and to hire thousands of people. So 25,000 jobs will be created at the height of construction. And this, as I said before, includes 2000 new apprenticeships. So and more than 70% of these jobs will actually be supported outside of outside of London, which is obviously very important. So as we build High Speed 2, our main suppliers will be awarding thousands of contracts and hiring thousands of people. This is important because many of these people will be working in our local communities and contributing to the local economy. So for instance, we're going to be using local shops and cafes, the small businesses and other services around. So local firms and companies could also benefit from contracts on High Speed 2 construction, bringing jobs into the communities. High Speed 2 Limited will be reporting on where workforce comes from, so we're able to monitor this and encouraging businesses of all sizes to work to, sorry, to bid for work. So we actually expect almost 60% of our contracts awarded to be small and medium sized enterprises. So just to give this some context, um, and just for the next slide, we um, we will refer to these small businesses. We call them SMEs, which stand for, as I said before, the small to medium enterprises. So uh, data from the end of March 2020 breaks down the representation um, by size and percentage. So large employers made up of 47 percent, medium 17 percent, small 14% and micro, which is 10 employees or less at 20%. So the proportion of people we do business with are, you know, the large mainly tier one contractors of 47%. But the second largest group is the 20% where, where are our micro organizations. And these are where the indirect opportunities to work for high speed too. So the small and medium businesses um, would tend to be those who work indirectly, which means they'll be subcontracted through our tier one contractors. So one more thing to address would be the potential barriers that we understand that SMEs working for high speed two will face. So we know that there's some lack of EDI awareness. So this could be things small businesses tend to not have, you know, the workforce monitoring or, you know, the legislative requirements or EDI training within their organization. So other barriers could be simply just a minimum requirements to tender for the, you know, for example, the insurance coverage or health and safety practices um, where large companies will just automatically have this due to their size and experience. I know that I understand that there will also be fears around, you know, an anxiety about how to ap apply for these tenders, um, you know, sort of what the reward is for, you know, all the time and capacity that, you know, we have to put in to applying for these. I actually have a video of a case study of one of uh, our SMEs that applied to work for High Speed 2. I think it sort of gives a really good example of sort of a, an organization not really understanding what EDI is. So just a quick two minutes kind of gives it some good context. I'll play it now. We're a seventh generation family business. We've been growing trees and shrubs here in Horncastle in Lincolnshire since 1798. 
HS2 announced the biggest ever government contract for the advanced procurement of trees. Seven million trees, something like 650 hectares, which is huge. This project is a once in a generation opportunity. And so I went to HS2 roadshows and to uh, local business group meetings where there was an HS2 speaker to learn as much as I possibly could about HS2 values and how to align ourselves with those. When we received the pre-qualification questionnaire, there were all sorts of uh, issues that we had to deal with, but one was EDI. And we were a little bit horrified by that because we had no idea what EDI meant. It wasn't an acronym that we used in our everyday business. So we had to look it up and it means equality, diversity and inclusion. We're a relatively small business and we didn't have an EDI policy in place. We sat down and said, well, we've got no chance now. That's going to eliminate us from this competition effectively. To win the big infrastructure project like that, we had to leave no stone unturned. It was my job to implement the EDI policies at Crowders. Um, very scary at the beginning, but once we got into it, it was quite easy to implement. We broke it down into different sections, looked at what was equality, diversity and inclusion. We looked at the demographics, the age breakdown of our staff. We looked at disability, we looked at ethnicity, we looked at sexuality. We looked at what staff we employed, what staff we retained. So we were already doing about 75% of EDI without even knowing we were doing it. We just hadn't formalised it. To implement the EDI policy, we looked at government bodies, we looked at local authorities. You look at what you've already got, do some gap analysis on what demographics, what information you already have, maybe just within your own payroll system, and then go on the internet, take some advice from ACAS or from another advisory service, and decide what you need to put into place. Myself and one of my directors decided to take a formal training course. It was very useful, it was very informative and very enlightening. I think particularly for the small companies like ours, HS2 had made us realise where we were lacking. So we have a two year plan in place now. So I think that really sums up perfectly, you know, sort of these small businesses that might have the fears of, you know, an anxiety and how they first start with, you know, what is EDI and, you know, to really understand that we are probably are doing a lot of this stuff already, but just not formalizing it. So just to, to talk about the contract requirements and to be awarded a contract at High Speed 2, we set out EDI requirements in the following six areas within our contracts. So those are EDI policy, recruitment, workforce monitoring, EDI training, supply chain diversity, and EDI external verification standard. So we challenge our tier one suppliers to deliver these during the contract delivery phase, which set out which is set out in their works information and scope of service. This contractually binds them to develop EDI policies and practices in recruitment, training, verification and accreditation standards. So High Speed 2 expects our tier ones to cascade to the tier two and tier threes, which would be your organizations, the SMEs, the small to medium enterprises. We do not expect our SMEs to deliver at the same level and to the same standard as one of our main contractors. It would just be impossible to do that and unrealistic, really. So this is to be managed relatively to the ability in accordance to your size. So if you're a small business of 50 employees or less, um, we would not expect you to have extensive EDI policies and procedures. Although we would want to see examples of changes that you can make, you know, sort of having any kind of robust recruitment strategy or some EDI data monitoring. Um, so this in itself is going to be an ongoing challenge, but obviously we see the benefits at all levels of an organization when you start to implement this. So setting the standard, um, High Speed 2 has an inclusive, sorry, an inclusive procurement model and in developing this, our message is that we want to be leaders and deliver a world-class railway service. This means obviously to be inclusive at all levels and all areas of the organization. So part of our measuring um, was this for, and I mentioned this before, using an external verification standard. So this is set out in our contract requirements for all of our tier one contractors. So High Speed 2 doesn't endorse or stipulate um, which standards of our tier one suppliers should obtain 
or which company they should use. However, we do um, we do encourage them to identify one standard to deliver. So we've actually chosen Clear Assured. This might be some new language for yourselves. And as of July this year, though, we've achieved gold status. So this is one of the first times in construction, in a construction industry, we've reached that and we aim for platinum status by April of 2021. We can set up more information on this and what these standards mean to people. Um, and we will be the only construction company as well to achieve that status by that time. So just a final wrap up for some of the points that I've, I've covered here and to reiterate some of the messaging around improving your chances to winning a high speed two contract. So really, we want to make sure that you collect and report on any diversity data, which um, will give us a transparent view of the diversity in your company and potentially where the gaps may be. This falls again back into the conversation around the skill shortage and you know trying to get the best out of our communities. Um, to challenge your tier ones with innovation approaches, innovative approaches around EDI. So I think this is kind of a personal thing that remember these large organizations do not always understand the experiences lived around people who live in these local communities. Um, and this is like really to bring out your own experiences. So that kind of brings me into the third point with practical commitments to EDI. You know, so for example, if you do your own type of flexible working or workplace adjustments, things that you've seen, examples, EDI is such a, you know, quality, diversity, inclusion is, is such a progressive thing right now that people are doing and we see a lot of change. So a simple even Google on that, what other companies are doing or conversations around your community, what other people are doing. So I, and the fourth one is to establish EDI's continuous improvement, the improvement that this is not just a tick box and that we want to see fundamental commitment to positive change. So again, this goes back to seeing this equality, diversity, and inclusion all through um, the levels of business and through our supply chain. So that kind of wraps up this part of it. I will pass it over back to Matt now, who will just talk about some of our tier one contractors. So thank you very much, and I'll, I'll be here to take any other questions. Thanks very much, Pamela. Um, yeah, some really good high level information in there. Um, and as Pamela said, yeah, just quickly on our, our tier one contractors, I, I'm sure some of you who are in the audience will already know kind of how that pyramid works um, and how we expect those requirements to be filtered down. Um, but as I said at the start, I think it's really important to remember that H is too limited as an organisation is kind of the, I guess, the, um, the delivery arm of DFT. And it's really our responsibility to to um, police and drive and work collaboratively with those tier one contractors to make sure that they are helping this project leave the legacy that we expect it to. Um, and EDI is one of the topics where we need that to happen. So I'm just looking through some of the questions and I can see one here, um, more of a comment, I guess, but uh, some tier ones appear to go through a tick box exercise to look good to HS2. Uh, us as SMEs find it hard to develop EDI as a result and um, without direct engagement with HS2 Limited itself. And that's a bit of a worry to hear. Um, you know, our expectations of the tier ones are very high and, and we're expecting them not only to uh, not only to meet these requirements themselves, but also to help and support SMEs um, down through the supply chain in doing that as well. Um, so, I mean, if the, you're more than welcome to send us an email to the local business email address, um, local business at hs2.org.uk with any concerns around that particular thing. Um, I think we, we'd love to know about that. And although we're here to kind of uh, monitor and and, um, uh, and drive the contractors forward, like we would love to hear from SMEs who are having difficulty with that because it's the only way we can really help improve those situations. Uh, we do put in place a lot of monitoring. They're asking for an awful lot of data from them. Um, so we do have visibility of things, but those kind of um, individual examples are really, really helpful for us. Um, you're a relatively quiet bunch. We've got another couple of questions there. I got a few pre-submitted questions from some SMEs who contacted me previously. So I might run through those and then come to the other one that's in the Q&A. If you do have anything else, just please feel free to submit it. And um, we've got a little bit longer for, for questions today, which is good. Um, so I had this one come in, which was uh, we're a relatively small business. Uh, do we really need to have an EDI policy in place? I can understand why larger businesses would need to do this, but it's hard for small businesses to do so alongside the pressures of running their own company. Is there anything there, Pamela, that you might be able to 
to give in terms of reassurance or? Yeah, of course. So High Speed 2 is trying to change the way construction is delivered across the United Kingdom. And it is important that anyone involved in the project recognizes this and tries to align itself to our values and aspirations. So, I mean, that said, we do recognize that for some SMEs that this will be a challenge. So we will bear that in mind, obviously, depending on the size of the contract and business. Um, it wouldn't be fair to ask micro businesses to have the same processes in place as a multi million pound company. We recognize that right away. So to be clear, though, employment and EDI legislation applies to all companies, regardless of size. And it is important that you don't um, think that this is another hurdle or something else to do. We don't want to discourage anybody. But if you embrace or exceed um, that we are looking at these topics, um, it might it's not just better for your business, but it also means that you you know you stand out to the from the rest of the market as well great thanks yeah i think that's exactly right i think i think with a lot of these topics and a lot of these values it's it's trying to look at these these things as opportunities for businesses um and uh, it leads into the next question that we had sent in actually which is um around you know we're not just expecting you to go and do this yourself um so there was a question here uh, is there any help for us or do hs2 just expect us to meet these requirements on our own so i can answer that again so um <laughs> So we've um, we've sorry we've partnered with the supply chain sustainability school. So they provide um, free resources for you to help develop and demonstrate the capabilities that we're looking for. Um, I guess so things like fairness, inclusion, and respect. There's a toolkit there um, that will it's very useful for everybody as well. Um, and I think that we will be able to send the links after this session. And we also have another a number of resources and short videos. This is all on our website. It's very transparent um, and this should give you some helpful background. So we can also share this afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, and just quickly on Supply Chain Sustainability School, um, if anybody didn't attend a previous session, we did one with them where they talked through um, how this, how their platform works. It's a completely free resource. It's really, really good. Um, and sort of as we touched on a bit earlier in the presentation, what it does really, really well is it helps um, businesses who are probably already doing a lot of the things we're looking for um, develop the uh, develops capabilities to fill the gaps and then also um, demonstrate you know gives you a way to, to an evidence base to be able to show the tier ones tier twos and indeed hs2 limited how you're actually meeting some of those uh, challenges so I, I urge anybody who hasn't to go and have a look at that supply chain sustainability school webinar uh, or or to visit their web page they've got lots of free resources on there they're incredibly helpful with this topic in mind um okay let's just just before we go to my final question that i was submitted to me earlier i'm just going to have a look in here and see what we've got um okay one around actually around employment which might be one for you pam um blind auditioning is great at reducing any potential bias but are there any strategies beyond the initial interview stage that will help us promote BAME? Hi, yes, so again, this is not my area, but I can definitely answer this question. So we have succession planning, which I mentioned before. So this is talent and succession planning within our organization. So this is really, we identify um, key, I guess let's say BAME members of our, of our staff that have the potential to be promoted. So they will be career coached. They will be guided on how to move up. And also to, I think another one that's really important is that we have the reverse mentoring within our organization. So this is somebody who's in a senior position to be mentored by somebody who is at a, um, I don't want to call it lower grade, but you know, the a grade um, below them that's on in a senior management positions. And it's really talking about the sort of barriers that they go over that they may be facing in employment as well and sort of the opportunities that they're missing um, as well as in the interview stage as well we do have career coaching and interview coaching as well for any of our and this is completely anonymous for anybody who's in a, um, a category that wants to apply for these roles so a few things definitely thanks that's that's great that's really helpful um so one here, uh, what is your EDI policy on rolling stock, um, whole train step free access and other trains? So yeah, there's quite a bit of information on our website about that. Um, we are expecting HS2 to be the most accessible railway in the world. 
Um, that's what that's one of our aspirations. And we um, we're working now uh, the rolling stock contract. Uh, we've had the tenders back in and we're going through that. And one of the requirements in that um, in that tender and in that contract is is that it includes that aspect of things, um, the passenger experience um, that we want um, to have for anybody using HS2, we're hoping to be the best in the world and that needs to include everybody. Um, you know, it needs to include uh, all different parts of society uh, and it's a really, really key part of our rolling stock strategy. Um, so yeah, it's it's included. Um, I don't have any details here with us specifically, but um, I'm sure we can provide some links to where that is um, after the session. And just having a look here. OK, yeah, so a um, bit more of a technical question. We want our monitoring through MSite and other biometric software. Many people feel reluctant to enter details that they feel will disadvantage them on site and will often leave fields blank, reducing the accuracy of data collection. OK, so I think that might be one we have to take away and, and go to our EDI's, uh, EDI team who, who manage that part of the business. I mean, we have the same issue. We have the same issue within HS2 Limited um, in terms of trying to capture the data of our employees. You know, we can't force anybody to do that, to provide that information, but it's very hard to come up with a strategy to improve um, situation in this field if you don't have the basic understanding of, of, of what your workforce looks like. Um, so yeah, I completely see how that would be a challenge um, and, and a fair comment. I think um, what we have to do as an organisation is to make sure our employees understand why we're doing it, you know, why we're why we're asking for this data and what we're going to do with it. Um, you know, it's it, it, admittedly it's slightly different for people out on site, I would guess, but what we the approach that we tend to take is that you know we explain why we want to use it and it's for these positive reasons it's not for anything else so I think there's probably some work to do there for our tier ones and uh, their contractors who run the sites to make sure people understand why this data is being collected um, it's not necessarily for uh, the purposes that people might think but it's it's to try and help improve the situation for people and there's definitely work to do around that I would say um OK, so I've got one more question which uh, was sent in earlier. Um, if Pamela is still there, um, what are your top tips uh, for helping businesses meet the EDI challenge that HS2 is setting? Um, so well, I think the key, um, yeah, I think the key is for the business to embrace the challenge and to stop and assess where you are. So I guess like the business in the video that we shared, um, the majority of companies are already doing lots of things and we are looking, um, you know, sort of in terms of requirements. It might just not be the case that they necessarily know how to express this in the language that we need to hear um, or in the evidence that we think that it might be a format that works. Um, make a plan, uh, understand the makeup of your own business, see where the gaps are and think about how you can go about addressing that. Your tier ones as well uh, should be able to help you. This should not be anything that's hidden from you. So contacting them as well, seeing where they can help and support you as well. I think it's very important to keep track of your progress and have evidence ready to share. So we always want to see what you're doing, but then also to how it's improving your business. Um, and you have to remember that this just won't help you working for high speed too. This is sort of the way that society is right now. It's very topical, um, even just looking around us in the world that we're living in. Um, yeah, and I think that these are the things that all the public sector organizations are going to look at from now on. Yeah, definitely. I'd agree with that. I think I think this shouldn't be looked at as a, as a hurdle. I think it's a challenge, but it's, it's one that actually actually will help improve the situation that we all work within. Um, so I think the companies that embrace it and come up with innovative new ways uh, to, to approach it um, are the ones that are probably going to succeed on projects like this. Um, so I had just had one more question, which is a bit more generic, which is around um, how do we get involved in the project? I think the first thing to do is to, to register your uh, interest and, and tell us about what your business does at hs2.org.uk forward slash local dash business. Um, then we'll pass that on to the, the contractors working uh, on the project so that they know what you do. And also, secondly, to sign up at compete 
youtube.com forward slash hs2 i'll share that link again uh, when we when we write out to people after the session and um, that is where all of our live contract opportunities are um so yeah we don't have any more questions in at the moment so i think we can probably give you all a little bit of your time back um so just to reiterate yeah please do visit our web page and uh, let us know what you do uh, there's some links there in terms of going and finding out a little bit more detail um, if you do have any specific questions, you can um, you can drop them in a line to us and uh, we'll look into them in a bit more detail. And please, please do visit the free supply chain sustainability school resource that's available. So it just remains for me to thank Pamela for her time today and to thank you all for attending. And uh, with that, we'll close the session. Thank you.